Bidirectional BFS literally means you have BFS from N sources simultaneously. Now, here it says simultaneously, it does not exactly mean asynchronous. I'll explain that later. Multidirectional BFS can be used when you want to find the shortest path from multiples of something to multiples of something else. For example, you want to find the shortest path to the nearest gate from each empty room. On this graph, we have two gates and all of the empty squares are empty rooms. The shortest path from this room to the gate is 1, shortest path from this room to the gate is 2, 1, 2, shortest path from this room to the gate is 1, 2, 3, shortest path from this block is 1, 2, shortest path is 1, shortest path is 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. You get the idea. We can use traditional BFS to solve this problem by running BFS for each empty block to find the shortest path to the nearest gate. Since BFS runtime is ON, the total runtime would be n to the power of 2. That's not as fast as we want. We can run BFS from each gate simultaneously. Whenever a BFS touches an empty block, it will be the shortest path from that block to a gate. Since we're running BFS simultaneously, at max we will visit each empty block one time. So the runtime is ON. To help you visualize this a little bit better, breath first search is starting BFS from one source. Bidirectional BFS, you start it from two source. I can't find a really good visualization for multidirectional BFS, but just imagine it starting from multiple sources at once. In my previous video, I explained that to run a BFS, you have a queue to keep track of which nodes to visit next, visit it so we don't visit a node twice, and our current node. To start a BFS, we put the starting point inside the queue, and we'll visit the starting point the children of the st starting point, the children of children of starting point, etc. Bidirectional BFS, we simply put both start and the target into the queue. What this will do is that we will first visit the start, then we'll visit the target, then we'll visit children of start, children of target, children of children of start, children of children of target, etc. By the same logic, if you want to run multidirectional BFS, you simply put all of the starting nodes into the queue. By popping nodes from the front and appending nodes to the back, we will achieve the effect of running BFS simultaneously from multiple sources at once. If we're talking about the runtimes in terms of n, the number of nodes in the graph, the runtime for BFS, bidirectional BFS, and multidirectional BFS are all on. It's because all three BFS algorithms will only visit a node once. Therefore, the max runtime is on, n being the number of nodes. If we're talking about BFS runtimes in terms of branching factor and depth, branching factor being the number of children, so for a, a binary tree that would be 2, depth being the number of levels, so on this little graph we have 4, the runtime of BFS would be exponentially slower than bidirectional BFS, bidirectional BFS will be exponentially slower than multi-directional BFS. Of course, this is under the assumption that you have a very, very large search space with infinite number of nodes. Uh, I can't find a really good visualization for this, but just imagine BFS needs to explore more number of nodes than bidirectional BFS, and multi-directional BFS needs to explore the least number of nodes. Let's run through an example. You're given a grid with rooms initialized with these three possible values. Negative 1 representing a wall, 0 representing a gate, infinity meaning an empty room. We want to fill each empty room with the distance to its nearest gate. If it's impossible to reach a gate, we should fill it with infinity. Since each empty room is initialized infinity, it basically means that if we cannot reach a gate, we just leave it as it is. For example, we have the image we've been using so far. The rooms are representing the 2D array. We also output our answer in a 2D array. It's a little bit confusing, but you can see this represents the first row. So 3 representing the distance to the nearest gate is 3, negative 1 is a wall, 0 is a gate, 1 meaning the distance to the gate is 1. And then the second array representing the second row, 2, 2, 1, wall. We can tell we want to use multidirectional BFS because we have multiple sources and multiple destinations, and we want to find the shortest distance from those multiple sources to the multiple destinations. First, we initialize some constants, our queue, and our visit is set. We proceed to find all the gates on the graph and append them to the queue to be explored next. We also add each element to the visit is set so we don't visit them again. While the queue is not empty, we're going to get the current coordination, the current distance, and assign the distance to the room. 
here we're actually assigning the distance to the gates because the gates are the initial elements appended to the queue. So when we explore the queue, it will be the gates that come out first. However, we're not supposed to assign distance to gates, right? This doesn't really matter because our initial distance is zero. And since gate is a zero, a gate will be assigned as a gate. And this will be fine. We then generate the coordinates that the current node can explore next, which is up, down, left, right. Okay, bear with me here. If the current coordinate is smaller than zero, bigger than its boundary, or the coordinate has already been visited, or the current location is infinite, meaning it's a wall, we simply continue and go to the next possible coordinate. If the coordinate is valid, we're going to add it to our visitor set and append it to the back of the queue to explore next. As you can see, multi-directional breadth first search is not that different from normal breadth first search. The only main difference is that you append multiple sources to the starting queue instead of just a single source. Let's do another question. This question is called Pacific Atlantic Water Flow. It's quite cool. Uh, there is an MXN rectangle island that borders both Pacific Ocean and Atlantic Ocean. The Pacific Ocean touches the island's left and top edges, while the Atlantic Ocean touches the island's right and bottom edges. The island is partitioned to a grid of square cells. We are given an MTEX and integer matrix of heights, where heights represent the height above sea level of the cell of the current, current coordinate. The island receives a lot of rain, and the water can flow to neighboring cells directly north, south, east, west, basically up, down, left, right, if the neighboring cell's height is less than or equal to the current cell's height. Water can flow from any cell adjacent to an ocean into the ocean. Return a 2D list of grid coordinates where results i equals coordinate denotes that the rainwater can flow from the cell to both the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. Here we see the visual representation. We have the ocean, Pacific and Atlantic, and over here we have our mountains. The shaded ones represent the cells that can reach both Pacific and Atlantic Ocean. Here for example, it can reach Atlantic Ocean because it can go to the smaller cells, but here it cannot go to Pacific Ocean since it cannot pass through any of these. It's actually not immediately obvious what to do here. We have Pacific Ocean, we have Atlantic Ocean, so how do we find out if the cell can reach both or not? As mentioned before, multi-directional BFS is needed where you have multiple of something trying to reach multiple of something else. Even though here we don't want the shortest path, the reaching something else property can still be used. Here we have multiple of something that is Pacific Ocean. See the borders? These are multiples of the something. Reaching multiples of something else, the multiple of something else are the cells of the mountains. So what we can do is run multi-directional BFS for Pacific Ocean starting with each of these oceanic cells to see which cells they can reach inside the mountains. We'll run another multi-directional BFS from each of the Atlantic cells to each of the mountain. If a mountain can be reached by both Pacific Ocean BFS and Atlantic Ocean BFS, then we can append that cell into our result. First, we initialize our constants, our two queues, and two visitor sets. Next, we add the starting points of our multi-directional BFS to both Pacific queue and Atlantic queue. So here we're going through the heights. So that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So we append these nodes that can be touched by Pacific Ocean into the Pacific queue. And we append these nodes that can be append that can be touched by the Atlantic Ocean into the Atlantic queue. Also, we add it to their respective visited set. Similarly, we're going to add all the nodes that can touch the top Pacific Ocean to the starting queue and all the nodes that can touch the bottom Atlantic Ocean into the starting queue. We're going to code the BFS function a little bit later. Basically, the logic here is that we run BFS for the Pacific queue and we run BFS for the Atlantic queue. We return the intersection between the result of Pacific queue and Atlantic queue, meaning if a node can be visited by both Pacific Ocean and Atlantic Ocean, then that means it's part of our result. For the BFS, it's pretty standard. While the queue is not empty, we're going to get our current coordinate. Next, we're going to generate all the possible nodes we can visit, which is up, down, left, right. All right, here's our long filter again. If the node is bigger than our bound, smaller than zero, or the coordinate is already visited, or 
the next height is smaller than the current height, we continue and skip the element. I'm going to clarify the height filter a little bit. What this means by next height is smaller than current height is that since we're starting BFS from the Atlantic Ocean, say we have five, right? Five is our current height. If the next height floor is smaller, then water cannot flow from four to five. Therefore, we continue and skip the case. Finally, if it passes our filter, we append it to our queue to explore the node next and add it in our visited set. And that's it. That's our second example of multi-directional BFS search. Hope you are able to understand how multi-directional BFS search. Now, it's a lot less intimidating than you might think. So yeah, see you next time. Bye.